Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us here tonight. So our first question this evening is to Dennis. And the question is, what voting system do we have now? And why is it so popular? The question is, what is the system we use? And I imagine some of you are familiar with it, but for those of you who aren't, our system is called single member plurality. Uh, it's also sometimes called first past the post, uh, using a kind of horse racing metaphor. Uh, it's also known as winner take all. And uh, that nicely captures the kind of dynamic of the system, where uh, in a single member riding version of our, our voting system, um, one person wins. Only one person is going to win in the contest, and that is the person who has more support than anyone else. Sometimes that person might have a majority of the support in a local riding, but they don't have to. Uh, it's, if there's a couple of people running, uh, if there's three or four or five people running, if they're all equally popular, well then they could win with 40% uh, or 30% or gosh, a couple of elections ago we had a conservative in Saskatchewan who won with 27% of the vote in the riding. Uh, so that is the, the system that we use uh, right now. There's another variation of the system that we use municipally. Uh, so for instance, Vancouver uses what we call uh, multi-member plurality or the block vote or at-large voting. And again, it, it works on the principle that the candidates who get the most votes are the ones who are elected to council and the votes are cast from the whole city as like one riding. Um, again, you know, the, the overall results uh, don't end. Um, it doesn't promise proportionality. Um, it promises that the person who's the most popular amongst everybody is the one who will win. Thank you. So our next question is to Barry. And what is wrong with the voting system that we have that it's just been unpacked by our colleague? Lots of things are uh, wrong with it, which I guess is sort of the premise under which uh, fair vote operates. As an introduction to this, one should understand that in my mind, there's no perfect voting system. Every voting system has flaws. There's just flaws of different sorts. The reason we have the system we have is because it's just been there forever. It's not that um, it ever was really enthusiastically adopted. It was just we inherited from the British. And at a time when you had Whigs and Tories and not much else, I guess, um, in a two-party, uh, or basically a two-party system, um, first past the post, if you only have two candidates in a race, first past the post makes sense, or at least it certainly uh, isn't uh, particularly troublesome. But in Canada, for the last, um, at least since the 30s, and probably since the 20s with the United Farmers, we've had a multi-party system. They, not all the parties have sustained over time, but um, we certainly have had sustaining parties at least since the 30s. Um, and that in that particular situation, um, plurality voting does not produce a majority, which at one time it, uh, at one time it did. Uh, in, in any case, what's wrong with the, uh, with the system now is that, in fact, it um, creates artificial majorities uh, that um, basically suggests that uh, in the last 75 years, that we go back to the end of World War II, um, there have been 23 elections in that time. During that period, there's only been two elections where any party has cleared 50% of the vote nationally. Yet, in the vast majority, 60% of those elections, we nevertheless have created majorities. So it's an artificial system that's unrepresentative. The problem is that all the other systems have, have, have problems as well that we might, uh, we might deal with. The reason I moved to alternate vote is that I think it's less radical, and that indeed the public, I think, might be more likely to be convinced because it's a less radical scheme. We'll, so I'll have an opportunity, I'm sure, to, to talk about that in a little more detail in a minute. That indeed the, the issue of basically getting reform passed getting the public to accept, remembering that, again, I was very much burned in my own mind by that 2007 result. Um, PR could make a lot of sense in a lot of ways. It makes most sense, I guess, to us, and it's frequently talked in Canada, and I'll stop in just a minute because there's going to be other questions that will allow us to get into this. But um, it makes most sense, I guess, if we assume that uh, the application of, of proportional representation in Canada would basically maintain the kind of, would be with the kind of party system we have now. But I'm not at all confident that that would be the case. And when we look at cases, now that some other countries that have adopted PR have more troubling experiences with it than others. But that um, it in inevitably is going to lead to more parties. It's also going to probably lead to a situation of permanent minority government, which minority government is great. In fact, these days, uh, I vote strategically basically to create minority governments. For much of my life, I just voted NDP regularly. Um, and uh, that ended, I guess, the second, that when Harris came up for re-election in 99, was the first time I didn't vote NDP. And ever since then, I basically voted in my own mind for parties that would, um, or for parties in my, my riding, and again, I'm in the riding you just, where you just ran it, uh, that in fact would have an opportunity to challenge the likelihood 
of a majority vote. So mm -hmm. for people, I don't know how, how many of you are from Waterloo, but uh, as I am and as, uh, as Diane is. But in uh, 2011, when in fact um, the NDP had a great year and the Liberals had a terrible year, I was voting Liberal in, in Waterloo because in that particular riding, it seemed like Telegdi was the most likely choice to, to block a conservative majority. Obviously, my one vote would change things. This election, when the NDP didn't do as well and the Liberals did better, I voted NDP. But again, what was basically in my mind was to create minority government because frankly, I think the NDP tends to have much more influence in minority government situations. But the NDP can, in fact, benefit from majority governments, too. And indeed, when they have done well, particularly in 90 provincially and in this last, the 11 election in Quebec, um, even though the system of, 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 of plurality elections bonuses the winners, basically gives to those that have and takes away from those that don't, sometimes it can be parties of the left and the right, you know, the, the left that, that, that can benefit from that as well. So it's, it's not quite so simple. But the, the problem with, with PR... Um, in my mind, is that if applied to Canada, it would probably be something that would, in fact, expand the number of parties. Um, so you're going to get another okay, chance at I'll PR start. because because we really want to talk about what's wrong with this voting system. And, and a couple of the salient points that really stood out for me was just that whole notion that in the last 75 years, we've had artificial majority governments. Only twice we've had a, a government that was a true majority. And I think I think that's a very salient point. To, to kind of thinking about why it is that it is worthwhile to think differently. The next question is to you, Dennis. You didn't get a chance to defend your proportional representation yet, but now is your chance. Can you please better help everyone understand what, what is being uh, termed proportional representation? So proportional representation is just a generic term for a bunch of different specific voting systems. And it speaks to... Uh, an approach to classifying voting systems that judges them by their outcomes. There's many ways you can figure out how to divide up the world's voting systems. But when people talk about proportional representation, they're often judging them in terms of what kind of results do they produce. And so proportional voting systems, in a nutshell, say, hey, you got 20% of the vote, you get 20% of the seats. That's the way that you know they work. Um, there are basically three major forms of PR. You'll hear people say that there are tons of different kinds of PR. And in a way, they're true because no particular voting system is exactly the same as the next one. But the details are often fairly small in terms of what distinguishes them. There's basically three kinds of proportional representation. There's the party list form of PR. And that's a system they use in Sweden and Finland and Norway and the Benelux countries. And basically, uh, there are a number of large multi-member ridings uh, in, in a few cases, the whole country might be a riding, like uh, Israel, but also the Netherlands. Uh, and so, uh, you know, parties run in these very large ridings, and at the end of the day, the returning officer adds up the votes for the parties and says, great, you, get, you got 20% of the votes, you get 20% of the seats. You got 15%, you get 15% of the seats. Um, so that's, that's the way that the proportional systems work with party list. The two systems that have been most often talked about in the Canadian context are uh, the single transferable vote and mixed member proportional. Nobody's really talking about party list as a, as a system because of the geography that we have as a country. Nobody would think it would be a terribly effective way to do things. But we have heard a lot of people champion either of these two other systems, mixed member proportional and single transferable vote. I'm not going to give you a how to be a returning officer version of these systems. I'm just going to give you the broad strokes of what distinguishes them. So the single transferable vote works in multi-member ridings. Let's say you got a five-member riding. Now, that, doesn't, that shouldn't sound too strange to some of you because you may know that, in fact, in this country, you, we use multi-member ridings quite often at the provincial level. So, um, so if you go back in time, you know, Vancouver used to be a multi-member riding. They elected, you know, three or four members from there. The city of Victoria used to elect three members. So multi-member ridings were fairly common in our system, particularly the provincial level. Um, and so SDB says, great, let's use a multi-member riding to elect but instead of saying you've got to get a plurality to get elected, more than anyone else, or a majority, now you just have to get a quota. In a, in a five-member riding, the quota would be roughly 20%. That makes sense, right? If you say to somebody, what's the fairest way to divide up a pie amongst four people? Yeah, you divide it in four, right? Everybody gets a portion, 25% of the pie. And SDV says the same thing, right? We've got five seats here, so if you can get 20% of the vote in that riding, you get the seat. What's interesting about SDV is that the voter is in the driver's seat about who the particular politicians are, because the voter ranks the candidates, one, two, three, four, five, as much as they want. 
And uh, so it's, it's a fascinating, you know, very sophisticated uh, voting system. Uh, it's hard to figure out how it's all added up. Um, but to use it, it's fairly simple. Um, the other major system that we hear about is called mixed member proportional. This is the system that was basically invented in Germany, footnote, actually Denmark used a system like this during World War I. But anyway, people mostly associate it with Western Germany, and this was seen as a great compromise between uh, the, the British and French influences of the occupying powers. So the British were like, no, the Germans should have first passed the post because it worked for Britain. And the French said, no way, we don't want that. They should have some proportional system, because that's what France was using at the time. And then America was like, you know what? I think the PR idea sounds good if it'll just keep everybody divided. And so they adopted this very unusual approach where they basically said, let's divide the legislature in half. Half the seats will be single member ridings, just like you would recognize in our system. The other half of the seats will be comprised from people who come from party lists. And basically, they run the election in the local riding, and they look at the votes that have been cast for each of the parties, and they say, okay, who needs more seats? If you were a party and you got 30% of the popular vote, right, they added up for the parties, but you only won 15% of the local seats, then they would give you the next 15% off your list. So in the end, the whole thing ends up being proportional. And some political scientists have dubbed the system the best of both worlds, because it's got the single member riding that people seem to like in the Anglo-American countries, but it has an overall proportional result. So those are your, your three kinds of PR, you know, in a nutshell. And turning over to Barry, and you're in favor of alternate vote. And if you could help unpack that, that would be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be a little briefer this time. The, um, yeah, basically, it's just a matter of, instead of just putting an X beside your favorite candidate, as we do in the current situation, you go one, two, three, four, depending on however many candidates there are. If you only feel strongly about one candidate and don't want to provide a second choice, you're not obliged to. But what happens is kind of what happens in leadership contests. Um, and it, the, the system actually exists, I think, only that I know of at a national level in Australia, the lower house. But um, uh, basically, the person who's at the bottom of the however many candidates there are, until somebody gets 50% of the vote, you keep dropping the person with the least votes on the previous count, and, and sort of looking at their second choice, and if that doesn't provide the somebody getting to the 50% level, you go to the third choice and so forth. And what it means is, as Dennis pointed out, that you, we frequently, over half our candidates in, in this last election, receive less than 50% of the vote in the, um, in the federal election. Um, what it means is that the person who is going to represent the constituency is going to, by definition, get a majority, because you're going to keep looking at second and third or however many choices until that occurs. And as Dennis pointed out, uh, there are cases, uh, the, the Pierre Boucher, I think, is the writing I remember this time, where um, the, I think the least popular vote is somebody got about 28% of the vote in, the, in, in that, that, particular, that particular Quebec writing. What it, what it does effectively then is kind of legitimize the local member. Now, it isn't, the reason I really like this kind of system, as I say, I, I kind of changed my mind a little after 07, um, is that, in fact, I think it's more sellable to the public because it's less fundamentally different from what exists now. Um, and I've just become very dispirited about the fact that something as dramatically different a change as PR, because PR has lots of things to be said for it, some problems too, but there's certainly things to be said for it. For example, in this last election, for somebody who's very environmentally concerned, you basically had four, if you want to look in Quebec, four parties that were environmentally uh, oriented, and one less so the Conservatives. That indeed, instead of splitting that environmental vote, people could go to a second, a third, and a fourth choice that was still preferable to the Conservatives. Now, depending on the configuration of any given riding, it wouldn't necessarily always come out the same way. There's one other attraction, though, about the alternate vote, which I think, you know, coming through the, uh, the, uh, the Harper years, which were certainly not to my particular political uh, uh, favor in terms of how things worked, what you tend to see, if, ca if parties are concerned not just about getting, obviously they want the first choice, that, that's the desire, but at least thinking and being conscious of a second choice or a, a third choice, that it's probably going to moderate politics. You're not going to see as extreme, certainly on the right and probably on the left too. You're, you're, it's basically going to, be, to lessen the likelihood for ideological extremism in the parties because they're going to be mindful of the fact that in many ridings they're going to have to pick up um, vote second alternate votes by people who would have otherwise preferred to not be part of it. Isn't locally here, isn't this similar to what we do for our regional seats? Because our regional councillors essentially run at large for all of the city of Kitchener or all of the city of Waterloo. So people 
can vote for two or three. Is it somewhat similar well, to exactly that? It's not exactly the same as that. Because they're not uh, ranking it, them? It includes some of the components of the multi-member district that, uh, that Dennis, but it, it allows people to go to a second or third choice. Right. Um, and so no, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't compare it to the, the, mm -hmm. that particular situation so much. What you described was multi-member plurality for okay. the block vote, like the, what I was saying in Vancouver, where you know you take people, you run them across you know, at large, in an area, and you, you allow them to elect more than one person. And, uh, but when we make, when we look at the math of the representation, uh, it can lead to some really skewed, uh, uh, results. Right. Um, often it's not noticed if you don't have parties, but if you do have parties at the civic level, you can really see how, how it also, it, it, it exaggerates a lot of the problems with the single member, uh, first past the post. Oh, system. that's great. A lot of people here are familiar with that. Um, method, so I kind of wanted to use it as a tool to describe the differences. In terms of um, the alternative vote, um, how does how does Dr. K's alternative vote meet the criteria for a proportional system? Well, it doesn't, um, because it's designed to do something else. Uh, so the alternative vote is what we call a majority system, right? There's basically you know three three and a half kinds of voting system in the world. Uh, you know, one is the plurality family where you can have single member or multi member. Then I've already talked about the proportional family where you've got three, you know, greatest hits of the, of the way that it's done. Um, you've got a weird, you know, bunch, like a little box full of what we might call semi proportional systems that are used in different places. But the other major voting system are what we call majority voting systems. And so the alternative vote is a majority voting system. A different majority system would be like the system they use in France. Right in France, you know, they have an election, and if nobody gets a majority, then they have another election two weeks later, and uh, and you know, then someone usually comes out with a majority because the voters can figure out who who is the front runner. At the pre presidential level, they make sure it's a majority because they only let the top two vote getters run at the pre presidential level. So, you know, Kay's proposal is for us to have a majority system, and and you know, it has to be judged on its own terms in one way because it it doesn't promise to do those other things, right? So it will. Uh, allow voters to um, open up their strategic possibilities. I mean, uh, you know, if you're a green voter, but you think the greens might not win your riding, then you could give the greens your number one choice on the freakish, you know, thing that they're going to win, and who knows, you know, something could happen. You can't have what you want if you don't ask for it. Um, but the beauty of the, of the alternative vote is that your vote wouldn't stop there. You know, if nobody wins a majority outright, then you could be the first, uh, your candidate could be the first eliminated, and then the second choice on your ballot, you know, maybe for, you know, the NDP or the Liberals, would then go to help that candidate. And so, uh, when we look at a country that uses the alternative vote, you know, we can see cases where the subsequent choices reverse the result. You know, the front runner, the plurality winner, you know, is suddenly overtaken by another candidate where the second and third choices start to add up. And, you know, some people say that's wrong, but I say, well, you know, if, if that's more in line with what the voters actually want, then I don't see, you know, how that could be um, objected to. Now, in terms of the question about uh, the criteria for proportional system, well, as I say, the alternative vote doesn't promise to proportionally represent parties, and it doesn't, right? So we know from looking at countries that use the alternative vote, and actually, we have a lot of experience with the alternative vote here in Canada, we used the alternative vote in two elections in British Columbia, 1951 and 1952, and we used the alternative vote for rural ridings in Alberta and Manitoba from roughly 1920, 1924 to 1955 and 56. So literally millions of Canadians have actually used the alternative vote uh, in elections. And so I did a paper for a journal, uh, Inroads, where I compared the results between Australia and Canada, looking at the kinds of things that the alternative vote uh, tended to do. And it's pretty clear that if you want proportional representation of parties, you're not going to get it with the alternative vote. It's also disappointing that the alternative vote does not help new parties break into the system. Uh, it does not help minor parties break into the system. And the, the, the weakening of the strategic pressure that voters feel is often a bit of a um, consolation prize. Because the practice, what we see in Canada and in Australia, is that the alternative vote has the effect of funneling votes back to the major parties. Where they've had breakthroughs for Greens in Australia is in the upper house where they use a proportional system. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other measures that when people are looking for things with PR, like uh, more diverse representation, the alternative vote does about as poorly as our current system does. And then in terms of wasted votes, uh, the alternative vote obviously does better um, than plurality because of the subsequent transfers, 
but it still leaves a considerable number of voters uh, not influencing the result, um, and basically orphaning voters in different parts of the country. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, the, the alternative vote shares with plurality its bias for geographic concentration. In other words, the, one of the most important things in plurality and the alternative vote is the geographic proximity of voters. Now, you know, maybe in the 18th or 19th century when, you know, we were mostly farmers um, and, you know, shared a number of those kinds of interests in common, that made sense. But in today's world, to make geographic proximity arguably the most important factor, um, I think, is very questionable. Thank you. So you started helping us to understand why you're not proposing proportional representation in your first question, but I'm going to let you continue with that. Discussion. One of the attractions of the alternate vote is there really is no wasted vote. Now, in fact, it may not radically change the, the result. In fact, probably it, you know, it doesn't, but it still creates more legitimacy in each writing because candidates, by definition, are going to have to get at least 50% of the vote. So this notion that you can't vote Green or you can't vote NDP because it's wasted, and that's certainly affected my behavior. I voted for something other than my first choice at times, as I was starting to explain, uh, in order to stop an even worse outcome by my, from my perspective for, for it to, uh, to occur. Apart from the, uh, that, though, on the, the proportional representation, again, in Canada, we're used to a particular system. New parties have emerged, not with great success, and certainly not with sustained success, but there has been the possibility of the Greens being an example of that, the Bloc Québécois, the rally that Mount Des Crédit de East in years gone by, the United Farmers going back to the 20s. So it's not that new parties can't emerge in our system. Typically, they, um, they don't. In countries that do have proportional representation, you can have, and again, it doesn't apply equally in all places, <coughs> but you tend to multiply the number of parties. You tend to create a situation where the likelihood, in fact, the likelihood of majority basically becomes nil. Um, and that as a result that indeed, and not, this doesn't work adversely in all systems, but that frequently the creation of a majority, particularly if you've got parties of substance that are antithetical to each other, Italy certainly had that system where you had the communists at one end and strong right-wing parties at another end, who would never go uh, 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 be in, in coalition, meant that in Italy for many years, the Christian Democrats always were part of the government. Sometimes they, they had left-wing <laughs> part partners, sometimes right-wing partners. But it was a system, particularly in Italy, that did not work well. Israel's another place that doesn't work well because of the fact that you've got small religious parties that basically bargain between the other, other parties that are in existence in terms of who they will support getting all sorts of various benefits for themselves. It's a system that can allow, and in some, particularly in the countries I just mentioned, does allow for small parties to have disproportionate influence because of the fact that they're less odious to, uh, to the parties that are looking for the coalition. So some of those small parties actually take on disproportionate influence. Um, and in many, like I, I guess the worst example in recent years is Belgium, which has other problems of its own because of the, um, the its bicultural uh, background. But where in fact putting together a coalition that included the, uh, the, the Flemish and the Walloons basically meant that they were without gover effective government for the better part of two years. Um, it, it, it gives small parties the opportunity to hold up the bigger parties um, for disproportionate rewards in order to be included in the coalition. Yeah, I, I think, you know, those are a kind of you know, a greatest hit suite of the kinds of things that we often hear about PR, and of course I, I, I cherish this opportunity to respond to some of them. Um, let's start with Belgium, a country that has used PR since 1899. Now, Professor Kay has raised the objection that uh, they took a long time putting their most recent government together. Now, that's one case out of how many elections have they had in Belgium, right? A lot. So I think it would be wrong for us to judge Belgium uh, on the basis of this, this experience and say that that's the kind of thing that you would get with PR. Um, no voting system will stop a social revolution, right? No voting system is going to prevent uh, some very significant things that are going on in society from coming to the surface. And so we've seen, for instance, in the United Kingdom, the rise of UKIP, uh, which is um, uh, characterized by many as an extremist party. And the fact that they've used first past the post has not stopped UKIP from gaining representation and considerable support. One member. Yeah, but if you look, uh, well, yes, one, one member. member with like 15% of the vote. But look at the council elections, and, you know, I mean, they are making significant inroads. So, again, and, you know, the, the beauty of first past the post is it's a barrier, it's a barrier, it's a barrier until suddenly it flips. Uh, and, you know, now they can go from being underrepresented to being overrepresented. So, um, 
there, you know, these other issues, I think, are important to address as well. Wasted votes. When I talk about wasted votes, I mean, to what extent can we design a system that, that allows as many votes as possible to contribute to the election of the choice of the elector? And when we compare PR systems to winner-take-all systems, you know, first past the post or, or uh, the alternative vote, what we find is 80 to 90 percent of voters have succeeded in a PR system in terms of turning their vote into representation that they prefer. I think that's pretty good. Um, whereas uh, the alternative vote is going to bring us up to 50 percent, or maybe more, but still a considerable number of people are going to go underrepresented. A considerable number of people are going to find themselves and their political voice uh, orphaned because of where they live, uh, rather than because nobody else supports what they want. Sorry, that really brings us into the next question, which is, because you're mentioning Belgium, and so are you, and I think the challenge is, is that it's fair to say, yeah, it was one election, it was, it was one outcome, um, but if you make a change, and that happens to be the one outcome that happens in the, in the given year after the change occurs, then, then, you know, then what? And, yeah. and so the... But the I, just, I just want to hold you there, because I, I just got a couple of other quick points. I know you're trying to move us on. But I think, you know, Barry Kay raised a couple of things that I think really need to be responded to. Okay. But one is on the multiplication of parties. And I don't think the evidence supports this. In fact, the multiplication of parties precedes the adoption of proportional voting systems. If you look at Europe, something I've studied, um, you know, from the period from the 1890s to the 1930s, it is the multiplication of parties that leads to the adoption of PR, not the other way around. Um, if we look at the number of parties, so the argument is often that somehow PR is creating the parties, when in fact, PR is a response. Uh, to this increase in the number of parties. Uh, the number, the, the effective party measure that Lippard, Aaron Lippard, a uh, California political scientist, studied comparative voting systems, shows that actually there isn't uh, this, um, you know, uh, multiplication of parties in PR systems. PR systems have on average 3.5 parties, and plurality systems have on average 2.5 uh, uh, parties. Um, on the disproportionate influence. Now, this is a big issue, right? We often hear the problem that somehow PR will allow the tail to wag the dog, that small parties will somehow have dis, we hear, this is, I love it, disproportionate influence. Well, um, I, again, I don't think the evidence supports that. If we look at uh, a, a set of cases that are comparable to Canada, right? So we don't look at countries that aren't like us. I mean, Israel has some very particular problems that are, I don't think, comparable to Canada. Um, and so, uh, you know, if, so in other words, our, our case selection, I think, should be based on most similar cases. And if we do that, if we look at countries in Western Europe that are roughly similar to our political and economic development, what we find is that they have not had these kinds of problems. Um, the tail wagging the dog problem has been addressed by a number of scholars who have looked at the way in which voters have punished parties that they felt were demanding uh, disproportionate influence in a coalition. Um, of course, we've seen a reaction in some party systems by creating a grand coalition. So in West Germany, they created a grand coalition between the right-wing party and the left-wing party to cut the center party out because both parties felt that the center party was being too demanding. So uh, I, I think that when we try to imagine what PR would do in Canada, we have to be very careful uh, to, one, be comprehensive. We can't just cherry-pick the examples that we think uh, are the most alarming or worrying. And we have to try to pick from examples that I think are most comparable to the Canadian circumstances. A lot of times it comes down to, and our next question is around local representation, because in, in, the, in the case where you talked about the Grand Coalition in Germany, I mean, people voted for a particular party with the, with the intent that they, they would play that particular role in government. And then they did the Grand Coalition and played a very different role in government. So similarly, with some of the examples that you you provided as well, like and when you go back and forth to get the 50% to, to get the actual majority, um, you know, maybe people feel as though they lose something in that in terms of their local representation. And that's that's really the question that I'd like us to talk about now is, is a lot of Canadians really feel that they want to know their politicians. They, they, they believe in that line that all politics is local. And, and they, and they wonder in, in these two different systems, um, who will they go to? Who will their local representative be? Will they feel as though they can forge a relationship with them? You'd agree that both systems accommodate local representation in the case of 
PR, it's the German DMMP, the, the German <coughs> system, where half the seats by definition are local. In the case of alternate vote, it's really like the current system, it, it, that all, all of the all, all of the, the members are elected locally. It's just that the it requires 50 percent because of this uh, of, the, of the second and third choice votes that, that creates it. So the notion of um, of, of local representation, I don't think it need be compromised by either of these. You know, it's ironic, right, that Sweden has some of the highest levels of public satisfaction with local services, um, and they have no local representation in their national parliament. Um, so, you know, there's a political scientist, Peter Mayer, he talked about North American societies are locked into what he calls the ideology of local representation, that everybody pays lip service to it, but frankly, the public gets very little for uh, the design. Um, very few people know their local member, very few go to see them. Um, people vote party. Even when people say they vote for the local member, they vote party. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? It's, it's, it's hard to get informed about politics. Politics is confusing and complex. And where there aren't parties, voter turnout is way down. Because it's hard for the public to come to grips with the complexity of the issues. So, you know, what we have to decide on the question of local, of local uh, representation is, what are the trade-offs? What are the trade-offs? People often have an inflated idea. You know, when people say, I want a local member to do, you know, what local people want, which local people do you want that local representative to answer to? Do you want the local rep you are the local representative to answer to you. That's what you're really saying. But that's not political. It's not political to expect that in a political system, politicians are only going to do what you want. You know, there are other people in the polity, and they are competing with you for influence. So we need to recognize that in every single riding, there are people who agree with you and people who disagree with you. And your poor member is, you know, got to figure out who they're going to side with. Okay, some issues, they can try to come up with a deal and make everybody happy, but there's an awful lot of zero-sum issues. Are we going to build that freeway or not? You can't half-build a freeway. So, um, you know, that's where I think a lot of the... the the, the calls that we hear for people. Another thing is, the problem is, it's like, you know, it's like a freebie. You go and say to people, do you like a local representative? <laughs> of course. What else would I have? Right? People have no idea of any other way to do politics than to have a local representative. So a lot of the information we get about people's preferences on local representation has to be cast against what would be some of the benefits of an alternative way of doing our politics. And when we ask people those questions, they often say, well, I like that too. Yeah, parties should get their proportion of the vote. And a party that didn't win an actual majority of votes should not get a majority of the seats. That doesn't sound right, even though it almost always happens. Yeah. It is very true what you said about um, everybody thinks they own their politician, even if they're on very different sides of, of the equation. And it, and it is very, very difficult to sort through that. And actually, I think that that's a really interesting question because um, it's not my next question on the sheet, but I still think it's an interesting question because because of the fact that politicians are pulled in all ways, does one of these voting systems actually help to address that better than another? So it, it could be that the answer is no, but but with proportional representation, for example, one could say, well, you know, 30% of Canadians voted for Greens, and we have 30% Greens in the House. And um, and so they're actually able to move the bar on the environment issue, and that's why people voted for them. So are they as pulled? I mean, because somebody could say, oh, yeah, that's what they stand for, and, and so we're not going to pull them. But I don't know. Like, I, have you thought about that? Have you thought about whether either of these systems actually help to address some of that? Well, the general school inappropriately accused me of sort of a, you know, a list of pop hits of the worst cases of PR. I'm really not even hostile to PR, that, <laughs> as I've mentioned. Well, the, the, next the, question, the next question is, where is alternative vote and proportional systems being used in the world? So, <laughs> so by all means, outline those. The, um, the, uh, Rick, the, the alternative vote is used in very few places at the national level. Australia is really the only example I can think of. They're talking about it municipally in Ontario right now, but the lo local members aren't happy with it because, frankly, local members almost all members are happy with the system that elected them. So they don't want to see any kind of change. And that's part of the reason we haven't had a great deal of, of change of any sort over the years. In general, I think it's fair to say that the more parties that are within the system, the less movement, there, the likelihood to move. If you have a two-party system, there's a little more room for flexibility in, in terms of issues. Again, if I go back to Italy or perhaps Israel or some of these other countries, 
you find where you've got, in those last two examples, I think you've got 10 parties in the national legislature. The likelihood that the parties are going to be very flexible and move is very great because they've got to be able to maintain their, their, their brand and their identity. Um, so the, the small, in general, the smaller the number of parties, the probably the more flexibility in terms of their positions and their willingness. I think it's more, when we look at, you know, what PR countries do, so let's look at what happens in Sweden or, or, or Holland or, or mostly in Belgium until recently, um, and, and some of these other countries, what you find is a retrospective process going on, right? Voters judge what happened before to decide what they think should happen next. And so parties often uh, have deals to work with each other when they go into the election campaign. So it's not a surprise, you know, when voters see different parties working together because they've often indicated to the public that if we elect us, we plan to work with this other party, we think that we can come to some agreement on a, on a set of priorities for this government. You know, the, the Prime Minister of, of the Netherlands in the 1980s said, it takes a long time to do things in the Netherlands, but, you know, when we figure out what we want to do, there is broad support for it, because it really does require a majority to get something passed. So the consultation uh, is such that uh, they really know what everybody wants, and there's buy-in to make the policy work. So I think your question, you know, would a PR system encourage a kind of fruitful relationship across these differences? Yes, I think it would. Our current system does not. Our current system, you know, when you help out another party, you're actually helping to defeat yourself. All right? It's win or take all. You can't, you can't get along with the other party because if you make them look good, it may help elect them and not your candidate. Whereas in PR, that kind of dynamic doesn't exist. Um, so, I would argue that, you know, voters look and they judge the parties based on how well they work together, and sometimes they change their mind, right? They look at a coalition and they say, I don't think that group works so well together. Mm -hmm. So then they change their mind and they vote for a different party. And I, I think you both really touched on this, this next question, and, and that is this whole concern around instability of government that's elected proportionally. And, and, so, and, and this, this notion that fringe parties will hold the balance of power. And I guess, you know, you spoke about other countries. So now I'm going to say, what, what's the crystal ball for Canada, right? So, so based on what you see in Canadian politics, based on the fact that, that, you know, in the last election, for example, Canadians were very motivated by change and, and to be change makers with their vote. Um, how likely do you think that Canada would actually find themselves in this position where fringe po powers hold the balance of power? We, you know, in Ontario, when we had the, the, the minority government, I mean, arguably, the NDP held a pretty strong balance of power. Um, so, so, you know, I'd, I'd value your thoughts on that. The, um, uh, look, the most compelling reason why I've moved away from PR to, and I'd be happy with PR as it, as it compared to the status quo too. But the most compelling reason for me is that in fact, I don't think it's going to happen. I th it's a matter of pragmatism that indeed the, um, the alternate vote kind of system is just less of a change. And I think it can be more easily sold to the public, which clearly in the provinces where they've had the opportunity for change, um, have, have rejected Ontario pretty decisively. But I don't think it's clear, Barry. I mean, I think that the work that was done after both the SDV campaign and in Ontario, the MMP campaign, showed that the public didn't even know a referendum was going on. Okay? You know, we, we're, we're using the referendum results as an opportunity to say this is not what the public wants. When we, when we survey the public about whether they know there's a referendum and a majority say they don't even know what's going on, and even fewer can answer any factual questions about it, that's a clear failure of the government to promote the policy that they claimed that they were in favor of the public making a decision on. So I, I think the jury is absolutely out on what the public thinks about it. Um, the public knows very little about any of our institutions, and that's not their fault. I don't blame them. They've got busy lives. They've got lots of things to do. You know, they tend to accept the results of our institutions if the parties that they vote for accept them. So there are various aspects of our electoral system that are quite complicated. You know, the formula that's used to work out the riding boundaries and the process by which these boundaries are established. This is not in the living rooms of the nation, right? This is being handled in the traditional elite way. We've got a bunch of political scientists. We've got a bunch of party hacks showing up to meetings to try to influence where the lines are drawn. And for the most part, the public says, oh, okay, that looks good. What does my party say? And when the party kicks up, when the party starts making a fuss, then their voters go, well, there's a fire over there. Maybe I should go and see if I should help put it out. Um, it's the same with the voting system, right? Part of the problem we have now is that somebody got it in their head that it was a good idea to go and ask the public to micromanage this process of democratic reform. 
And that was unrealistic. It was unrealistic to expect that the great vast majority of people would say, yeah, Pilon's book looks fantastic. I'm going to read this. No, they're not, right? Um, so I, I, to me, it, 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 what the public thinks is neither here nor there because the public is not on the driver's seat of this issue, right? In the, in the 150 years, the 18 countries across all, you know, the, you know, the Western industrialized countries, the, the key driver of change was what the party system wanted. And that's still true. Uh, so if we move forward on this, it will because, it will be because our liberal government wants it or thinks it's in their interest. And Barry, I think, could be right that this liberal government thinks that the alternative vote is the system that's in their interest, and they will promote that. But I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I think there are divisions in this current federal liberal government. Uh, and I think right now, they're working them out. They're trying to work out a process because they don't actually agree. There are some liberals who think a proportional system would be the right way to move forward. No. And, and there are some liberals who say, uh, uh no, don't change anything. And others who think, yeah, this alternative vote sounds good. You really think the liberals, given that the liberals aren't always in power, but indeed would prefer a system which almost by definition would mean they would never have a natural majority, um, to a system where, not all the time, but frequently, the liberals have had majority governments. It's hard for me to believe, again, I, I'm very much a believer in the fact that politicians, like the rest of us, but politicians especially, act in terms of their self-interest. Uh, I, I just find it very difficult to think that the liberals would seriously countenance a system it would basically mean that they would never again have, a, have a, a, the ability to have a majority. And yet systems change, right? So, I mean, you know, Barry outlines, you know, a classic rational choice argument that, you know, people are, it's in their self-interest to keep the system, they have the power, ipso facto, it follows the system will never change. But it does change. We do have cases of national voting system change in countries. And so it really depends on the kind of politics that are going on in the country. And I would have agreed with you about the Liberal Party until recently. Right? I mean, Liberal Party in 1919 adopts PR, gets in power, doesn't introduce it. Liberal Party in 1934 adopts PR, gets in power in 1935, doesn't, doesn't introduce it. Right? Liberal Party, you know, in, in 1978, under Trudeau, says, you know, let's look at PR. You know, 81, they go to Broadbent and say, let's talk PR, but they don't actually do anything. So the Liberal Party have got a long history of courting this issue and then abandoning it, you know, at the mantle. Uh, and so in this case, I would have expected the same thing. I was totally expecting. They would just kill us in committee. But then they come out after the election and reiterate their promise to change the system. Not just they're going to have a committee, but this is the last election that we will have under the current first-past-the-post first system. So yeah, maybe that means they're, they're setting us up for AV. But I don't know. So on the alternative part. vote, though, I, I think that a lot of... The, the media is obsessed with the complex the complexity of ranks ballots and i would and i would suggest to you that in all likelihood the broader citizenry would would allow themselves to be confused by that complexity well, as well be confused by all sorts of things you still basically have these single member districts it, other than just putting an x beside a candidate you can still just put a one and leave it at that but you have the choice of being able to go beyond just your first choice and do all the initiatives. and so what do you think happens though when people basically stack their their ballots. So now all of a sudden your your people are coming to your door, they're knocking on your door and I saying, I want choices. well they're they're basically saying vote for one person and vote for me. Right? Like don't 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 use another vote on anybody else because I want to make sure that I win for sure. Plum. So you need to go in and 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 in the change system though, they, in the the system that we're talking about um, in some writings, they would naturally get 50% and do now. It gets a little more complicated and varies from writing to writing. I would argue it's more understandable and more acceptable. And for that reason, there's one other thing I just wanted to add because I think we're yeah. going to the question shortly. Uh, and that is, if in fact it's deemed appropriate to have a, um, a some sort of public referendum or sort of uh, commitment to the system, I think whatever the system, be it um, PR or alternate vote or frankly anything else, the notion of abstractly endorsing it before the fact is part of the reason why, in fact, it was rejected so soundly. I would suggest that any kind of change should result from the fact that you try it for a period of time, I would argue, a couple of elections, perhaps a period of eight to ten years, and only then, it, it, at that particular time, you, you would then go back to the public and see, having experienced it, whether, in fact, they like that system or they prefer to go back to what they have. On that question, because that's really where we are right now, is a referendum required? And this is this is a constitutional question. So constitutionally, is there a requirement for a it referendum? Needn't it needn't be, but in I wouldn't be surprised if, in fact, a campaign was drummed up that this is a fundamental change. Even in Ontario, when we had the referendum, of course, we didn't even clear 40%. It 
but they had the preface suggesting that there had to be 60% and there were some other conditions as well in NBC. Um, I, I, I have a hunch that the public relations of it would suggest that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, there would probably be the suggestion at some point a public imp imprimatur would be placed upon it. I'm just suggesting that it not take place before the system is tried, but after you experiment with it for at least a couple of elections. The question is, the media is obsessed with complexity. Yes, they are. They're obsessed, right? Why? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, the people of Ireland, papers. you know, the people of Ireland use the single transferable vote. Uh, I can't believe that they are, you know, that much smarter than we are. Um, but that's the implication, right? The implication is Canadians are too stupid to use a system other than an X. Uh, now, one way we can test this with evidence is we can say, what is the ballot spoilage in the different systems? And did you know that the ballot spoilage in Ireland is lower than in Canada? More Canadians make a mistake with their ballot making an X than the Irish do numbering them one, two, three. These systems are complicated to count, and AV is not complicated. It's not complicated at all. Um, it's more, it has more steps than plurality, but it's not complicated. Single transferable vote, MMP, yes, these are complicated to count, but they're not complicated to use. So that's just, you know, more media muck raising. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a real thing. It's just making trouble. Right. Um, when we look at the evidence, it's just not supported by any evidence. And, and, and the way you deal with problems of election administration is you administrate. So, you know, you have a transition election, you're going to need more people at the voting locations, the parties are going to have to hand out how to vote cards. There's all kinds of ways you can deal with that, right? Um, if, you want, if you actually want to solve the problem rather than just raise the problem. On the constitutionality of the voting system, the voting system is not constitutional. You know, the BNA Act very clearly sets out Parliament's rights to make all rules as concerns elections, except those areas in the Constitution where certain things have to be maintained, like the proportional allocation of seats to provinces. But other than that, it is very clear that the Constitution gives Parliament the right to make that change. We have had 10 voting system changes at the provincial level in this country, historically. Mm -hmm. None of them have been declared unconstitutional. So this is, again, another fake argument, not based in any kind of reading of our actual Constitution. We're pretty privileged today, actually, to have these two professors with us who have dedicated their their life's work to considering these types of systems. So it, it's a real privilege that you're here. So you might want to seize the opportunity to get up and come to the microphone and ask a question. Uh, my name's Dino, and I'm concerned. Uh, traditionally, with the system we have now, uh, politicians aren't saying, vote for me because I'm the best. It's don't vote for them because they're not the best. Okay. There's a negative connotation to that. With the rank system, there's a, a tendency to um, have more civility because now you may be pandering for the votes of the people you're trying to defeat. Sir, in your system, if you have a block of people that are coming off a list, uh, how is it um, apparent that there'll be that civility? Because you're still fighting for, if you have larger jurisdictions and have half the seats that are gonna be represented by people that you vote for, and then another half that come off the list, how do you still create that civility? Well, yes. I mean, you know, that is the great accomplishment of democracy is that we're allowed to disagree and we don't want to lose that. Right. We don't want to erase the fact that we can strongly disagree with one another. I think we should obviously do it as politely as possible, but we should be able to represent fundamentally different positions. I don't want any system that 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 reduces that. But I think people are, are noticing that under our current system, it, there seems to be a lot of grandstanding. You know, is this a significant, substantial difference? You know, you were just arguing last week in favor of this, but now you seem to be totally against it, and it just seems to be about competitive party stuff. And so would these other systems change that dynamic? And I think Barry has articulated that the alternative vote would create some dynamic for parties, particularly ones that are close to each other, that would where their voters would swap votes to not beat each other up. Right? They would have an incentive to find a way to work together because they would be thinking, well, if, if you're not going to vote for me first, I want you to at least vote for me second. Now, PR uh, it has a similar kind of dynamic. I mean, of course, you know, people on opposite sides of the spectrum may be hostile to one another, um, but parties that are closer to one another will probably conceivably have to work together uh, to form a government and come up with a common program. And so there, too, you can't just dump all over the other people if next week you want to get in a cabinet room and, and work effectively with them. Uh, it won't convince the public that you are going to be coherent in government. So I, I think that at the electoral level, the alternative vote uh, could create a slightly different dynamic than, than plurality. I think at the governing level, PR could create a much more 
um, functional set of relationships between different political actors. Thank you for your question. My name is David. Uh, thank you for being here. I, I don't want to preclude Dennis from answering uh, this if he wants to, but it's really directed more to Barry. Um, Barry, you mentioned that under the alternative vote, uh, when you rank uh, your ballot, the ones that are lower in support at the bottom, they can have their votes reallocated, so then you end up with a majority, so that the person that's actually liked the most in a riding gets elected. I think that's great. It's very similar to first past the post, winner take all. Um, but you should, if you have the most support, win locally, that's fine. Um, the problem that I have, and I want you to clarify for me, you say that you feel that, if I understand correctly, that it's not wasted votes. But the problem that I see is, is if you have a party that has maybe 15% support, 10% support nationally, right across the board, they never win in any one riding, they end up with no representation nationally. And yet, if you took those 10% from 10 different ridings that if everybody just moved to the same spot, they'd get 100% of the vote. Um, so it just, the demographics just doesn't seem to work for me for alternative vote, it doesn't seem fair. And I'm just wondering if you could kind of clarify, because to me that seems like wasted votes. Yeah, well, again, I guess I'm defining a wasted vote by, by people who in fact decide to vote not for the first choice, but for the second choice, because the first choice doesn't stand a chance. Look, look at the Greens in, in Canada. They do have that one riding in, uh, in Saanich Gulf Islands that they were able to win, a, a very untypical riding in many ways. But in fact, that's a great example of perhaps the, the party that gets particularly penalized as a result of, of many people who would otherwise prefer to vote for Green, thinking they don't have a chance. And they, in most parts of Canada, probably really don't have a chance. It, in in the, the system I'm talking about, they can vote for their first choice. Is it fair? Absolutely not. Without question, PR is a much fairer system. I don't think we, we disagree with that at all. The, the trouble with PR, and I, I'm not particularly troubled by this, but the people who criticize PR feel that, in fact, it leads to less stability and can, in fact, lead to real problems with regard to, to instability in, in terms of coalition formation. Maybe Canada would not act like Italy and Israel and so forth, and, and I, I, I understand that. Uh, maybe, in fact, it would look, the Christian Heritage Party might well emerge in this situation. Uh, it's not just the Greens. There's parties on the right that, in fact, may feel that they're doing a little bit better as well. I'm not at all challenging the notion that first-past-the-post or alternate vote variation on that is a fairer system. It's not. Okay, so you're not saying that it... Oh, it's not fair at all. Okay. What it, uh, what it is, there's, there's no other benefits. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, every system we talk about has some shortcoming. And it's a matter of sort of weighing up which shortcoming, at least under, uh, I think alternate vote is more achievable, and that's really the reason I've tried to support it, or have been lately supporting it. Uh, that alter alternate vote is a much more modest variation on the current, and therefore, I think there's a better chance of it actually being um, put, put, you know, put it, uh, being uh, put into place. Whereas I, I'm afraid that I'm, I'm no longer able to dream, as because much of my life, I actually, I would have been totally in support of everything Dennis has said. But I, I've just, Reality has caused me to feel, particularly after the, the rejection in Ontario in, two, in 2007, I just don't think it's going to happen. And in fact, I'm prepared to at least look at the alternate vote as something that will perhaps uh, lessen the extremism in, in Canadian elections and at least create the circumstance whereby local candidates are going to have to get 50% of the vote from somebody, where, you know, it can, in contrast to what happens now. I'm in no way suggesting that alternate vote is fair or it's not. Thank you. But in, in a way, I mean, the alternative vote is more unfair to parties like the Greens, um, because at least in the plurality system, a party whose support is diffuse may pick up a seat or two, uh, may win a riding with, you know, 35%, because they can manage to, you know, put together some votes in a particular riding or the way the vote cuts they can win, but under alternative vote, that would be completely eliminated. Uh, so it would make the entry of new parties even harder. And the evidence we have from uh, Canada and Australian experience is that the alternative vote makes uh, party competition less, you know, it, 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 it entrenches uh, existing parties uh, and funnels support back to them. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, you know, those who want minority representation but not geographically located, and the examples that Barry gave us earlier were all geographically located ones, right? So uh, the Bloc Québécois becomes the uh, loyal opposition of the country, um, you know, in 1993 on the basis of the fact that its votes are very, very close to each other. Uh, so regionally concentrated parties can get representation in first past the post, but spatially, you know, parties that are, the support is more diffuse, 
um, have a very difficult time. I just want to say thank you for clarifying that, Barry. It sounds like you both agree that nationally, the alternative vote does not represent people. Yeah. Pro probably. For I mean, sure. again, the, we're speculating in terms of its impact, but in general, I would tend to agree with most of yeah. what Dennis has said. I have a question about alternative vote with respect to Australia. It seems that Australia is the, the major system that we talk about when we talk about alternative vote, but I don't understand how Australia works. Like, it seems, in terms of his, historically, it, it seems to have a bunch of right-wing parties that are, I don't know if they're competing against each other, if they're all running in different ridings, and then I don't know how well Australia actually manages to elect uh, a, a anybody from small parties, although uh, Professor Pilon is suggesting it's, it's not, and I don't really have a good sense of whether when we're talking about uh, alternative vote, we should be thinking about it, uh, can how well we can compare it to Canada. Okay, thank you very much. So if, if anyone had troubles hearing that question, it was, um, it was really about Australia. Um, the gentleman pointed out that there have been challenges with Australia and how relevant it is to Canada. I mean, Australia is fascinating. Uh, it, in many ways, it looks like Britain. You know, it's got a, a Labour Party, it's got a right-wing party. Um, uh, you know, so in that sense, it departs from Canadian experience, where we did not develop uh, a national left-wing party until the 1930s. Uh, but both the United Kingdom and Australia developed left-wing parties coming out of the 19th century. Uh, so, you know, not not exactly comparable, but in some ways comparable. Um, the adoption of the alternative vote, like most voting systems, was about power. And it emerged because of instability in the party system. So Australia is founded in 1900, and there's a free trade party, and there's a, a non-free trade party. And then there's a very small labor group. And so uh, they decide that they're going to use first past the post. They use it. And uh, this is going on. The two parties expect the labor members to just be absorbed. But they don't. The labor party gets stronger and stronger. And by 1910, 1914, the labor party is going to eclipse one of the old parties. And now the two old parties say, we need to change this voting system. This is no good. So they decide to adopt the alternative vote. Because the beauty of the alternative vote is the two right-wing parties can trade support for each other and prevent labor from going up the middle, right? Which in a plurality system, if you've got three parties, you know, two parties could split the vote and the third one could go up. So we'll fix it. We'll rig the system back in our favor by adopting the alternative vote. Except it doesn't work. Um, and so during World War I, the party system busts apart. Another party comes up. Anyway, long story short, uh, they stick with the alternative vote. It doesn't stop labor from coming to power, um, but they stick with the alternative vote. And over its history, they have basically always had three parties at the national level. The Labour Party, a right-wing party, and a rural party. You know, it was called the County Party. Now it's got a different name. Now it's called the National Party. Um, so, um, so there's a Farmers Party and there's an Urban Party. And those two parties work together using the alternative vote. They basically trade preferences, and they have lots of agreements to do that. Those three parties, in one form or another, have dominated the system. Now, what is interesting about Australia is that they have been able to, new parties have been able to trade deals in the lower house for support in the upper house. So the Greens have signed stand-down agreements with different parties on the promise that it, they'll, they'll work it out so they get a seat in the Senate. So the Senate is proportional. That can be handled quite differently. But in the lower house, the only influence that small parties have is to say, well, we'll encourage our supporters to give their second preference to you rather than the other guys. Yeah, just briefly, uh, the, the one Canadian example which you might have added, uh, just to reinforce your point, was in British Columbia where, in fact, that allowed the rise of social credit in order to keep uh, the old CCF out, out of power. The, uh, the right-wing parties in instituted, um, instituted the alternate vote um, between the Liberals and Conservatives, effectively. This allowed the rise of social credit being a right-wing alternative that was neither Liberal or Conservative. As soon as they came in, uh, they, they, they rejected the system. But, again, it was used in a very manipulative way. I'm not at all convinced uh, that, in fact, um, the alternate vote, well, it, it's not a fair, particularly a fairer system. I think it could, I think there are benefits, modest benefits to be sure, uh, to be added. Um, I'm just basically disillusioned that we're ever going to see PR, and mm -hmm. um, PR isn't necessarily a perfect system either. Given that the, the Liberals are committed to something, we're not clear what that's going to be, um, 
I'm prepared to give a, give uh, alternate vote a shot because I think there are some attractions to it. Right. But it is not going to radically change the, the status quo. Thank you. My name is Wendy. I want to thank you for coming for this. And my question basically is, since we're doing an entirely new system, um, this is our opportunity to actually develop something that isn't in any other part of the world. I know political parties are going to continue to exist, but do we need to develop our system based on being part of a party? Proportional representation, you have to be part of a party in order to get the extra votes. Um, what I'm proposing is an extension of what we currently have, which is each party gets together and they um, elect their candidate. Now, when you get to vote, if you want to vote for the Liberals, you have no choice in your riding but to vote for the Liberal that was already pre-selected by the party. If we had mega ridings with five representatives in the riding, and we made those nomination processes five ridings wide, any party that had as much as 20% could elect an individual. Come election time, every one of those candidates would be on the ballot, which would mean everyone who voted would be putting their support behind the person that most aligned with their values. This would require more than one vote per person, probably 20 for the whole riding, with 5% um, of the votes required for one, one vote in Parliament. So, Wendy, if I understand correctly, you're suggesting another system other than the systems that are here. Yes. And it'll take you a while to unpack that whole system. Because, but that it, is okay. only one more point. Okay. If you support, we could look at having people being able to register in a riding where they wanted to vote, which would allow them to elect someone who had a smaller percentage. That's all of it. Thank you. So fundamentally, if I could take the, the, your first question out of that, was why do we have to be assigned to these types of voting systems? Why do we have to look to another country and their system? Why couldn't we develop a Canadian-specific system? Absolutely. So, and and I'm, I'm, I think that, to be forthright, I think there's a lot of people who would, who, who would have different ideas on what the system could look like. And so I'm just going to give everybody a heads up. It's going to take us a long time to unpack a whole bunch of different systems if everyone wants to share with us <laughs> their unique one. So I think it's more more broadly to, to, to ask the question, is there a Canadian-specific um, system that we could develop that would maybe be better than everything else that's out there? You know, we look to other countries because uh, their systems work. Right? They've worked for a while, and you go, oh, okay, that one, that's tried and true. It seems to work. So, you know, it makes sense rather than starting something new. But every country looks to their local context. So, you know, in, in 1867, we designed some double dual member ridings so that uh, religion wouldn't become politicized. So there were a couple of ridings that were very specifically designed so that there could be a Catholic and a Protestant, liberal and conservative candidate so that the, the, the polity wouldn't divide on the basis of their religion. So every country does that, and we would too. And even if we took what looked like someone else's voting system, we would adapt it to our purposes. You started your comments by saying that proportional systems require political parties. That's not technically true. The single transferable vote doesn't require parties. In fact, Cambridge, Massachusetts uses the single transferable vote for its city elections without parties. Um, and the SDV was used for 19 municipalities across Western Canada, in most cases where there were not political parties. But SDV did manage to represent the different streams of opinion. You know, in the same way that in Toronto City Council, there are no parties, except that there are. We know that, uh, that there, are, there are political associations that all those councillors have. I imagine it may even be lurking here in this council room, not pointing any fingers. And so uh, what SDV can do is SDV can reflect those things. Uh, and like you, you seem, you know, you're, if I understand your concern, you want the voter to be in the driver's seat of the actual people, and STV does that as well. So now, in fact, there are uh, examples using MMP of people running as individuals, and you can run as an individual, not as a member of a party in an MMP system. Uh, people have tried to register themselves as an individual party um, for the MMP vote. Didn't get them very far, but they could. So, um, so I think there are some options that we could look at. I, I would have to look at the details of your plan to really be able to say, uh, you know, what I thought of it. You know, what you, you described sounded interesting. Um, again, uh, I'd love to see SDV, quite frankly. I think it'd be, intellectually it'd be fascinating. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, 
much of what I, you know, it basically caused me to move away from PR is just more of an acceptance of what is doable. It's a modest change. Um, I think it, it, it's not going to create a, a brand new system. It's perhaps not even going to be particularly fairer. But I think there are, are the, the fact that we are going to at least require members to get 50% of the vote, and we're probably going to lessen the likelihood of political polarization. To me, that's an improvement on the status quo. Um, and I, but I, I'm not even confident that's going to happen. But the notion of a more dramatic change, I don't think it's going to occur at all. You know, Thank I just want to I just want to comment on Barry because the theme of Barry's comments, uh, you know, are, are pragmatism that this is doable, um, this is reasonable, this is realistic. And you know, I get that argument. Uh, and yet, you know, when we look at some of the most significant changes in our country, uh, the first response is always that will never happen. You know, gay marriage never happened. I'm wearing this ring, right? Gay marriage happened. Uh, all kinds of things that people said would never happen, never, not in a month of Sundays, you're never going to see that, don't even hope for it. And what happens is, is that people go along and they're like, oh yeah, whatever, oh, it's not going to happen, then a few more people, and then suddenly it just tips over. And so I can't go along with that kind of pragmatism. Uh, when I look back at when I started working on this topic almost 30 years ago, nobody heard of it. Nobody had a clue what I was talking about. PR, I'm not trying to sell something. But now, look at what's, what has happened. PR is on the lips of every political party. People who are politically active know what proportional representation is. People understand in a comparative way what other countries have accomplished by using proportional voting systems. It's not so easy to pull the wool over the public's eyes as it was 30 years ago when nobody had any clue about it. But frankly, most of the public knows nothing about it. So I think you know we're continuing to work on it. We're continuing to press on it. We're looking for openings. And this government has opened a door like no government has opened a door before. And I don't think we should give up, you know, the game before it's even really started. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I get the pragmatism, but the time for pragmatism is not now, right? Right now, we should push for the maximum of what we want. That's the way you bargain. You don't go into the employer and say, you know, hey, you know, just give me whatever you want. No, you always ask for more than you think you're going to get. And that's what we need to do right now, I think. Thank you. Yep. Let, let me say, though, this is not the only opportunity. We've had least the recent opportunities I mentioned provincially. Mm -hmm. And goodness, the NDP was in power provincially in, in 1990. And in fact, had the and there were plenty of polls that suggested that, in fact, they were not going to win that subsequent election. They had the opportunity to alter, you know, to change the political system. And for whatever reason, they chose not to. Yeah. Um, again, I, 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 in, a night, in a better world, I'd like to think that some of what you said it applies. I'm, I'm less confident, though. Please go ahead. Good evening. My name is Gordon Nichols. Thank you very much for taking the time to come this evening, gentlemen. Uh, I've really appreciated uh, your comments. Um, for the benefit of the public, I'm the guy that got the article in the record yesterday morning. And uh, if you didn't read it, there is a copy available on the table outside. Uh, clearly, I was trying to make a case for mixed member proportional but with one small change, and that was that instead of using first past the post for the um, constituency component, we should replace it with um, what you're calling alternative voting, I call preferential <coughs> voting, it's the same thing, uh, with the difference in my proposal that you only rank the first and the second candidate, whether you go for two or all 10 of them, if there's 10 on the ballot, that's something that would get worked out in the details. Um, my question, though, is this. As an old guy, I'd really like to see that what we're trying to do this time around is actually going to happen. And there has been failure in Ontario in the past, and that's already been discussed. And in the past election, if you look at the way the percentage voting went, almost 70% of Canadians voted for three parties that ran on a platform of saying, we want change. But they don't apparently want the same kind of change. And so my question to you is, is it going to be possible to come up with what I call an MMPP system, where we mix both the preferential component with the alternative voting component? And if we could, would that guarantee us a 70% support base and we could get on with it? I kind of see that as two questions. One is, do you think we can find a hybrid in Canada? And the second being um, this notion of will it happen? Anything could happen. You know, the question is whether it will happen. 
Uh, you know, we had a famous hybrid system in Alberta and Manitoba. Well, famous amongst you know, people who notice these things. Um, but it was used by the public for 35 years. Uh, and it basically combined the single transferable vote in the urban areas with the alternative vote in rural areas. This was seen as a great compromise because you had, you know, lots of people in the cities, so, you know, the PR system could work there. And then you had not as many people in the rural areas, so this was a way of trying to maintain some sort of constituency uh, that was connected to the people. Um, so, you know, anything's possible, but I think, you know, Barry's quite right to draw our attention to the political interests that are at stake here. We have two levels of discussion, right? We've got the, we've got the public discussion, which is often about values and ideals and all of my work is about saying that's not where the decision is going to be made, right? You're not going to advance very far by stepping into a question of voting system change at an ideal level. You need to understand it politically. Whose interests will be served? You know, Barry mentioned that the NDP were in power in Ontario in the early 90s. The NDP are a funny party because in every other country, the third party was always for PR. But the NDP only came around to PR in about 1990-ish. Um, and in fact, over from 1995 to 2005, the party was kind of wavering. Some were for it, some, you know, weren't. They're kind of playing footsie with the issue. Since 2005, they've become much stronger in supporting it. And there's a reason for that. They won at the provincial level. And so the provincial branches of the party basically said, we don't want to change the system. It works for us in BC, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. So we are looking at that at the federal level. Here's why I'm not using idealism but actually a different kind of pragmatism to understand our opportunities. I think today's National Liberal Party is quite divided. I think that Justin Trudeau has managed to come into power owing very few of the traditional power brokers within the Liberal Party very much. So he's been able to have quite a bit of latitude to act. He's had the ability to do all kinds of things that normally the veto players in the Liberal Party would clamp down on. You know, you're not going to do that. You know, we got to pay off our favors. We got to get our funders, you know, in line. But because he came to he came to power when the party was looking, you know, pretty bad, um, he doesn't owe them anything. Now, how long that will last is an interesting question. But what it means is that you know, crazy stuff could happen. You know, he could decide to ignore a whole host of traditional veto players in the Liberal Party to advance this. But it will depend on who lines up in different in in different areas. On this combination of AV and MMP, that's actually been used in a number of Eastern European countries uh, where they've used AV for the local ridings and then a kind of MMP, usually not quite proportional uh, for the national allocation. No, only that indeed, I guess I was just counting, there have been six provinces that have had provincial NDP governments at one time or another in, within my memory. And none of them have basically, yep. for whatever reason, including probably self-interest. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure the Liberals are going to be any more noble about it than the Democrats were. Sort of. Thank you, Gordon. Who was next in line there? I, I don't want to beat this, uh, hug this horse about the, um, and Barry's point about the pragmatism of a change that isn't such a significant change. I, I think I agree with the previous speaker, 70% of Canadians said we want something to change. And to me the question is, well, is the resistance to change, specifically um, to your point, Barry, is it is it in the public that is would be reluctant um, or hesitant to take on a substantial change, or is it the parties themselves? And if it's the parties themselves, particularly the leading party, because I think the, the other parties at this point perhaps would see an advantage in a system that allowed them to have some representation rather than effectively none. And so, I'm sorry, so the Conservatives and Liberals having effectively none? Or? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, frankly, at this point, I guess it would be the Conservatives who have effectively none. Um, having gone from, from a, a complete majority to the loss of a, a complete loss of majority, and, and really not having much of a say in what happens in the governance of Canada for, for four years, it, it, it strikes me that when we talk about the self-interest of parties being not met until they achieve this thing, this magical position called majority. Isn't there something in a minority government where, where the parties have a, a solid position to play that is advantageous to them? Um, to, to put it differently, to have continuity through each election cycle rather than to have a stop and start kind of relationship. A couple of points there. Um, 
the conservatives, and I mean the conservatives are out of power now. I think they harbor the dream that they will again one day be in power, maybe not in four years, but at some point, just as the liberals would have felt that way when they were, they were out of power. I think their, their hopes for the future are a majority down the road. Um, but, but the notion of reform and change, I mean, they're, they're terrific terms politically. They're substitute generics because they mean everything and they mean nothing. Uh, if reform and change can mean anything to anyone. It can mean a move to the right. It can mean move, move to the left. Do we look uh, at, on the political right? I'm sure there are people that may have thought that Stephen Harper wasn't conservative enough. Um, people on the left that may think that the NDP is not socialist enough. Um, to, to be able to put that the terminology into more concrete terms that we can really agree on what the change means. As long as you're talking in a vague concept about change, it can, it can and does mean anything. It, it, it means different things to different people. Uh, the 70 percent that may have been unhappy, I, frankly, I don't think that many people that voted in the last election voted primarily because of the election system. I, you may have evidence to the contrary. Uh, there were all sorts of reasons, and frankly, the Conservatives had been in power for the uh, better part of 10 years, and it really was time for a change. But to, to think that that was largely or even significantly about the electoral system having to be changed, um, I, I don't buy. I don't buy that it was largely about marijuana, which um, uh, Pierre, uh, what Justin Trudeau talked about, or about abortion, or about you know many of these other issues. Um, that indeed, it's it's it, the, the idea of favoring change, whether it's on the election system or anything else, does can and does mean a lot of different things to different people. And for us to assume that. A 70% figure means X or Y is, is something I, I have trouble grasping. You know, your question is, you know, is a part of power better than no power? I think that's what moved the liberals on this issue, was they found themselves in third place, which you got to think was pretty shocking, right? Never before in their history were they in third place at the national level. This was an entirely new situation. And there was no guarantee that there was going to be any recovery. Right? They had Dion, that was a failure. They had Ignatiev, that was a failure. Now they got this new guy. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen. And uncertainty is a ripe formula for turning to things like PR. Because PR basically nails things down. Right? Instead of falling further, you can basically shore up your support. And so I think that the liberals said a piece of power would be better than no power. And that got the issue onto the table. I think a lot of people, and I think a lot of liberal supporters, were alarmed at what the conservatives were prepared to do with their majority government. Uh, and I think that, uh, um, you know, the, the conservatives were always more vulnerable than people realized. I mean, 39.5% of the vote, that was not a stunning victory for Stephen Harper's majority. But frankly, 39.8 for uh, Trudeau is not that stunning either. So, you know, it's not, there's no, no guarantee that what's happened now is unchangeable. There's, you know, the, 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 the classic argument is, I'm out of power now, but pretty soon I'll be back. And the reason parties want that power is because there's a public face of politics and a backroom face of politics. The public face of politics is, hey, truth, beauty, and justice, and sweetness and light, and babies, and picnics, and all the stuff that we all agree on. And the backstage is, okay, I'm paying you off because you gave money to my party, and I'm going to change this law to benefit this group, and let's have this lunch over here with these millionaires. Now, if you don't have a majority government, you can't do that kind of stuff, right? Not as easily. So... So the parties will, the main two parties will fight like hell to keep first past the post because it's essential to their business model as a party. But when that system is broken, when they don't think they're ever going to get back to the trough, suddenly alternatives start to look good. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, are the liberals feeling lucky? You know, do they think that it, this is the return to the normal? Is this, are we back to the good old days? You know, it's, it's, it's the liberal party of the 20th century, we're back. Or do they understand their own vulnerabilities? Do they understand that they are a hair breadth away from being tossed back to third place or back to the opposition benches? And if they do, if their internal research, and they've got very, very smart people working for them, if their internal research says we're a lot more vulnerable than we look, they might be prepared to trade the current system for a system that will put them at the center of every coalition that we've, we've ever seen. So, you know, I, I think the Liberals are probably more open to a discussion than I think Barry does. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here and um, for hosting it as well. Uh, the, um, Barry, this is directed at you. Uh, I, I come to this meeting wanting to understand the differences between proportional representation, alternative voting, and so on, um, and, and also to hear a case for and against each of them. Uh, each of those classes of, 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 of voting systems. Um, I, I, I'd be interested, Barry, if you could articulate briefly, beyond the fact that it's doable, 
Um, um, what are the advantages of, of moving to uh, a proportional or, uh, or preferential voting or AV over the existing system? Because if, if the only reason to do it is because it's doable, but it doesn't achieve a significant amount of change, why do it? Well, the key word, I guess, is significant. Um, it, it can be characterized as a band-aid, I guess. I, I do think it's an improvement on the status quo. I think, in fact, eliminates the need for, um, uh, again, the strategic voting or uh, and the, the wasted vote concern. And in, indeed, Dennis suggested maybe it's true that the, the, the Green Party or the NDP, for that matter, wouldn't do particularly better in, in this kind of system. I think time will tell. But what it does mean is that no new Democrat or Green Party supporter or Christian Heritage supporter or any other party supporter who is of a party normally in power, at least can vote for the third party of their first choice. It also means that there's a democratic legitimacy to whoever gets elected in the various 338 now ridings across the country will in fact have been endorsed at some level, not necessarily always as a first choice, but at some level will have been endorsed by 50% plus one at least of the people that are voting. That is an improvement. I think it is, it is I'm not even sure it's doable, quite frankly. I'm not optimistic even about that. But indeed, I think, it, it, given the political circumstances and the fact that the public has, in fact, show, shown in Ontario and BC and PEI, has shown a rejection of change. They have not felt that the current system is broken enough. They may, people may grumble about it. 70% may talk about change, but change can mean anything, as I was Well, 58% in BC in the first one is usually a win. Right? I mean, 58%. I mean, the government that won didn't get 58%. Uh, again, you know, BC was the closest example, and yep. in fact, perhaps should have been, employed, it, it, it been introduced at that time. I would certainly argue that 50%, if 50% is enough for Quebec to separate, 50% is enough to at least try a new electoral system. Um, but the fact was, that, was a, that, that happened in large part because BC had a very unusual set of election yep. results previously, including an election where the governing party got fewer votes than the opposition party. Yep. That's also happened federally in Canada a couple of times. In 70, yep. 79 was an example of that. Uh, the next time around, it wasn't endorsed quite so enthusiastically. Yep. Nonetheless, um, again, I'm, my position, again, I've, I've been a largely a supporter of PR for most of my life. Uh, but indeed, I'm just sort of coming to deal to grips with reality. I think it's an improvement on the status quo. It's not nearly as dramatic a change as Dennis is suggesting. I don't think Dennis's proposal and the need of what Fair Vote generally supports, the idea of PR, I just don't think it's going to happen. And indeed, I think it's worth a try to at least try and, and remedy the situation a little bit. And maybe, in fact, if it is deemed to be an improvement, because we're speculating about what the results of alternate voter, for that matter, what PR would actually uh, be down the road. We, we can't be sure that it would, wouldn't be like Italy. We can't be sure that it would be like Australia. We're, we're speculating about that. You may be right. But indeed, I do think that it's an improvement. I don't suggest in any sense that it's a dramatic change. It isn't. So we're just going to go on to our next question. For Professor Kay, you mentioned one of the arguments against PR is that it uh, disproportionately favors the smaller parties. I was hoping you could expand on that. Well, that, that, that gets into the complexities of the political system. There are political systems where, in fact, small parties have had disproportionate influence because you've got two large parties um, I mean, Israel's one example I'm familiar like with. Like the block? Well, other yeah. than geography, yeah. the system. block is, is disproportionate. Um, yeah. Although, at, at the time the block was in power, that wasn't, uh, the block at the zenith was not, was not in a minority government situation. Yep. Uh, but yeah, the block with Quebec only support, with candidates only in Quebec, was in fact the official opposition with 54 seats yep. uh, out of uh, 300 or what, and whatever it was, or 308 or whatever it was at the time. Yeah, uh, there are circumstances where we can see where small parties have had disproportionate influence because the two large parties would not, in fact, be able to agree with each other, and they start making deals with smaller parties to, to give them all sorts of benefits, even though they represent a very small proportion of the population. I'm not saying it's going to happen in Canada. I don't know. Maybe we'll get a pensioner's party. 15% of Canadians are pensioners. Maybe in a system where even if you had a 5% floor, we're, in fact, pensioners. Party of, 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 um, benefits that are only going to benefit pensioners will in fact be that that party will be able to demand that there are extra benefits for that group. But I, but I think the examples, Barry, of Europe is that that's not what's happened, right? If we look at West Germany, we look at Holland, we look at Denmark, we look at Sweden, you know, we look at these countries that are much more similar to Canada than Italy, right? I mean, Italy had a lot of particular issues. You know, the main opposition party was a communist party that basically everybody agreed couldn't come to power, right? I mean, it was the most stable system, right? One party controlled the government from 1940 Eight to 1991. That's pretty stable, right? And yeah, another stable, factor that stable with election, with new governments turning over every 11 months. It was just that the same party was always in those governments. And you know, I mean, there are interesting nuances to the story. For instance, they had secret balloting 
in the legislature, which meant that enforcing party discipline was very difficult in the Italian system. And that's totally divorced from PR. I mean, most PR systems operate like we do, where our people get up and they say what they think, and you know how they vote. And that allows the party to enforce the proper party discipline. So when we look at countries that are comparable to Canada in terms of their political and economic development, the things that Barry talks about, while speculatively possible, have not actually come to pass. Don, did you have a question? Well, being an engineer, I'm interested in long-term planning. And uh, I give one example that's really important to Ontario and probably all of Canada is the transportation problem between London and Oshawa. Now, there are many solutions to this kind of thing. A high-speed train going both ways between two, a bypass north of Toronto. But typically, this problem will take about 25 years. And four-year four governments just can't tackle a, pro a project like that because they cannot show a benefit after four years. And this is one of the big benefits of coalition government, which results from proportional representation, is that in each election, the, the cross-section of the government does not change that much, and therefore they can continue projects that are started. And that's what I admire about, and all of us would admire Europe for this, because their long-term planning, they can do it. And we're, we're not able to, for instance, the, uh, in the United States, the uh, U.S. Corps of Engineers estimates there are 70,000 bridges in the U.S. that need repair, and we're in a similar situation. And so one of the benefits that hasn't been mentioned is the practicality of being able to do long-term planning with proportional representation. That's, a, that's an interesting overview from one of my former professors. Uh, the, I guess the assumption that indeed uh, PR uh, necessarily guarantees long-term stability in me. Long-term stability in Italy meant a very corrupt government uh, with the Christian Democrats. Uh, I mean, there are so many problems with the political system. Indeed, you're talking about uh, roads and long-term planning concerning them. Uh, I, I'm thinking of global warming. I'm thinking of the problems with funding our pension scheme, the problems with funding um, health care. Um, as the population ages, uh, that in fact there are lots of problems that keep getting kicked down the road um, by by governments because they're thinking only of the the next election, the next two, three, four years, not not what's going to happen in 15, 20 years or, or further down the road than that. The answer to your concern is really longer terms of government instead of having elections every four years. If we had them every 10 years or 15 years, then indeed we would have much more stability. Um, you may it may be that um, that PR would in fact allow for that. I'm not at all convinced that indeed the different parties would necessarily act in concert. Maybe it wouldn't be as crazy as Italy. I don't think it would. Um, but that I'm not at all convinced that parties that are in conflict with each other electorally are necessarily going to be not thinking about the next election and how they can game the, the system relative to their others. I'm not sure. I'm not convinced at all that PR would solve. The problem you raise is real in many ways, not just about highways. But I'm not at all convinced that PR would in fact ameliorate that kind of situation. Well, I mean, again, I think what we need to do is try to look at some evidence and see, you know, have PR legislatures, again, in countries that are comparable to Canada, have they been able to engage in more long-term planning? And, you know, one of the problems that is identified with first past the post and would also be true in the alternative vote is what uh, people call policy lurch. Uh, so you, because you have these decisive shifts in government that don't really follow, you know, what people have said with their votes, uh, you can have a party, you know, introduce a set of policies, the next party comes in, takes those policies out. Party comes, party B comes back, puts them back in. Next, pretty famous example: this British Steel, nationalized by Labour, denationalized by the Conservatives, renationalized by Labour, denationalized by the Conservatives. I mean, who benefited from this kind of policy lurch? Again, my example from the Netherlands, where the Prime Minister said that it takes us a while to work out the policy that we're committed to, but because we have to get a real majority uh, in in the Parliament, the work that we do is worth it. Because by the time we've come to a decision, we really have heard a lot of stuff. And we really have built up the relationships that will make the parliament, make the policy work. It's not enough to pass a policy, right? You need that policy to actually have some legs in the community. Who are the people who are going to make this thing, this thing work? First past the post governments are standing on a very, very narrow foundation. Not broad enough to get the kind of support to engage in the long-term policy uh, planning that you've just discussed. I don't think the problem is the public. The public gets it. You know, they are often fine with the idea that we're going to commit to something now that will pay off later. The problem is in the electoral incentives of our parties. And first past the post, and frankly, 
the alternative vote as well, privileges the now because it's a fight to the finish. And if you win, you win it all, right, for a very short period of time. In PR, parties don't have these illusions. They don't have an illusion that a, a snap election is going to deliver some wildly different result. They're probably going to be uh, pretty similar to last time, maybe a slight change. So they have an incentive to think long term in terms of their partners. The challenges they face are often just the unpredictable stuff, right? Economic downturns, disasters, you know, things that they can't predict, but they nonetheless have to respond to. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, I, I don't. I, I think the difference between Dennis's positions and mine are just a matter of uh, optimism versus skepticism. Um, that indeed, I, but I, I would suggest that uh, Europe is going through some some yeah. challenges now, and that indeed I'm not on the issues of refugees, but on, on many others as well. And uh, the notion that things just go happily rolling along for 20 years spans under under PR, I would question that. It can happen. It doesn't necessarily happen. Um, again, uh, you know, again, I, I, I don't think we really fundamentally disagree. We have, uh, there's sort of nuances that in, in terms of differences. I'm just not at all optimistic that the current governing system that we're going to have is going to allow for a change of the electoral system. When we've had electoral, in most of those changes you mentioned, you know, I was remembering when you were talking about in Alberta back in the 30s, uh, most of those people who have experienced alternate vote then are now dead. But indeed, uh, there aren't that many people that have really lived under any kind of alternate system that we've had. Um, I do think alternate vote is an improvement. It's not a dramatic improvement, and I haven't tried to suggest otherwise. Uh, but that indeed, I think that may be as good as it gets coming out of this liberal government. Dennis obviously is more optimistic than I. Well, I, I think optimism versus you know pragmatism is the wrong way to do it. You know, it's, it's I have a different analysis of the power dynamics I think that are possible and the things that could affect the decision making of those leaders. Um, I don't think the problem is the public. Uh, you know, when the SDV AV system was adopted and used for decades in those provinces, there was not a revolt in the street. People were not eschewing this new system. Where's my British voting system? You know, none, none of that, right? People did it and went along with it because the parties they supported were prepared to accept it. And the same will be true in this country. People cannot like something they don't even know, right? They've never experienced. You go and say, well, do you want something different? You know nothing about it. It's totally different. Most people are going to say no. Um, so once they experience or see the value of it, or we see how their interests are answered, I think the answer, you know, could be different. Um, yes, Europe is going through lots of changes. Uh, there are lots of things happening. There's been some interesting research on the rise of extremism in PR systems, and there are extremist parties have emerged. But the research suggests they don't get very far, that the mainstream parties won't touch them or won't work with them or won't introduce the policies that are important to them. And what happens is that after a while, the voters then go back to the other parties. So it's not that PR, you see, our system says, you know, there's a possibility of extremism. We better make the system really uncompetitive. We better deny people what they say because we've just got to be, we've got to worry about this extremism. Whereas under the PR systems, okay, yeah, they let the extremists come out of the woodwork, but they don't get very far because they still have to get their friends and neighbors to go along with their extreme ideas. And thankfully, they don't. On stability or instability, I just want to mention that when we try to measure those sorts of things, we can go at it a number of different ways. One way is we can look at the number of elections that different countries have, right? If you have an unstable political system, you would expect them to be elections happening more often than, say, in our system, which is so stable. Actually, there have been fewer elections in PR systems than in our system. Um, we could look at the tenure of the government. So how long you know, do governments stay in place before there's a significant shift? Again, PR systems are almost as long. Again, you know, leaving out Italy, which I have to say, you know, the two eyes, Italy and Israel, they're always at the top of the list for people's examples, uh, but they really are outliers. Um, you know, nobody, nobody says Zimbabwe. There's your proof that first past the post doesn't work. <laughs> Look at that mess, <laughs> right? Of course not, because you know the problems in Zimbabwe obviously have very little to do with the voting system and a whole lot to do with everything else. So I think nobody here is arguing that the voting system is going to lead to sunshine and lollipops for everyone, right? We are still going to have to face the difficult uh, differences that we have. But I think the evidence of a hundred years of use in Western Europe is that these countries, barring cataclysmic challenges, have managed to grapple with these changes in a more deliberative and democratic way. In a way that has allowed people to air their differences, but ultimately when a decision is made, it really does reflect a majority, and sometimes much more than a majority, of what the people want. And you know, I am not afraid of democracy. I think the problems of democracy are answered with more democracy. 
We don't solve the problems of democracy by removing people's ability to make these kinds of choices. And our current system is just too undemocratic.